We started a couple of weeks ago a discussion of the so-called Neo-Assyrian Empire. This is the time when Assyria was at its dominant power, and there's several kings. We're looking at each one of them because every one of them is mentioned separately in the Old Testament, with the exception of maybe a couple. And so we've seen how in each case there is a significant interplay between the Assyrian history on the one hand and the Jewish history on the other, beginning with Tiglath-Pileser III, who starts up in 745, breaking the peace that I've called the Jonah effect that had gone on for some 40 years. He is notable because of his connections with Ahaz, and you recall Ahaz made a deal with the devil named Tiglath-Pileser, and at that point Israel or Judah really became obligated to these lavish tribute payments that saddled subsequent Jewish kings, especially his son Hezekiah. So Isaiah describes this in other texts as well, mentioned Tiglath-Pileser in that connection. Shalmaneser, his son, is the one who comes and lays siege in Samaria. And it was under his watch that the ten northern tribes began to be deported, as you recall. However, his successor, a successor probably uh, assassinated him during the siege and took over. His name was Sargon II. He was the one who finished up the deportation of the ten northern tribes. And he's also the one who came back in about the year 714, 713 and attacked the Egyptians because they were rabble-rousing, and it was in that connection that we hear the prophecy of Isaiah warning Hezekiah not to make a deal with the Egyptians against the Assyrians. Hezekiah follows that counsel, but he does build a tunnel. We talked about that last week. That was in 710. And so Hezekiah continues to make these tribute payments to the Assyrians that had been inaugurated by his father Ahaz, and that brings us then to the next one, Sennacherib. And we looked at him the last time we were together. Sennacherib came, of course, in the year 701 and brought this massive army with him, wanting to defeat both the Egyptians and, the, and Judah. But for some strange reason, he went home tail between his legs, defeated. And of course, the Bible tells us the reason was because the death angel came and wiped out 180,000 of his troops. And I don't have any better explanation for it than that. But he goes home, and so that's really the end of the story of Sennacherib, and it brings us this morning to his son, and that's where we're going to pick up the story of what's going on, and this is Ezra Hayden. Ezra Hayden is mentioned in the Old Testament. He's not prominently mentioned because under his watch, you don't have a significant interaction between Assyria and the Jewish people, but he's certainly there in the background. So he's mentioned by name in 2 Kings 19. He's also mentioned in passing in Ezra chapter 4. He inherits the Assyrian kingdom because, you recall, the two older brothers of his, the older sons of Sennacherib, had assassinated Sennacherib. They did this because Sennacherib had made himself unpopular with the Assyrians, having sacked Babylon, which was viewed as a holy city, and that was offensive to the Assyrians. And these two older brothers thought that people would support the assassination of their father, and then they, of course, could take over the kingdom. The one detail they didn't work out beforehand was who was going to be the next king. And so once they killed the old man, they get in a squabble with each other. And the, the Assyrian people weren't so excited about killing the king anyway, even though they didn't like him that much. That wasn't a very popular thing to do. So that brought then Ezra Hayden, the third son, who was able to rally an army to support him, and really most of the troops in Assyria defected to him anyway, and so these two brothers are driven out. That's precisely what the biblical account indicates happened. The two older brothers killed Sennacherib and then were chased off into eastern Turkey to a region we would call Armenia, and it was called Ararat, and that's where they wound up and they were never heard from again. So that is really how Ezra Hayden then, this son, comes to the throne. He only rules for about 12 years, fairly short reign. He takes over, of course, this fairly massive region that's shaded in green there, which represents the state of Assyria at that time. The first thing he did was ingratiate himself to the Babylonians by rebuilding 
their city that had been largely destroyed by Sennacherib, and so he is able to win a certain degree of popular support and even affection among the Babylonians, and they are no longer much of a problem for him. It's about the time that Ezra Hayden becomes king that Manasseh becomes king in Judah. And so basically these two rulers rule concurrently. And of course Manasseh rules for about 50 years, a long time, notwithstanding his fairly wicked ways. So in 686 he becomes the king in Jerusalem, while Ezra Hayden is ruling in Babylon. The Scythians are a group that's up on this map to the upper right section, the section called Scythia. If we had more map, you'd see that that's east of the Black Sea in a region called the Caucasus. And they were Indo-Europeans, they were fairly warlike. When I've taught this material to ninth graders, I always say what you think of with a Scythian is somebody like the orcs in Lord of the Rings. Big, ugly, only semi-human, like to eat meat raw, that kind of person, you know? And they were just vicious, and they were migrating down from the north and kind of putting pressure on Assyria coming in from the east. So that's part of what's beginning to stir the pot a little bit in the ancient world. The other interesting character that begins to rule about this time is named Gyges. Gyges rules in a region called Lydia, which is Asia Minor, it's western Turkey. And I mentioned him because last week I was suggesting you might want to go out and buy Herodotus. Remember that, the histories? And he gives us quite an expansive background of a lot of ancient historical materials, many, much of which really connects with biblical history. The first king that he talks about is Gyges. And so if you are reading Herodotus, you can kind of put him in his historical context as well. And he does pop up again in our story. So he begins to rule over in Asia Minor. You got the Scythians coming down from the east, putting, or from the north, putting pressure on the east. That's kind of the picture that Ezra Hayden is dealing with. Ezra Hayden, first of all, launches a short campaign against the Medians almost immediately and picks a fight with them. They'd been a little bit restive, and some people think that really was the beginning of the end. He may have planted the seeds of the destruction of Assyria by going over and somewhat gratuitously kind of ravaging their land, trying to show them who's boss. But of course, the Medians were a pretty tough people, and they didn't forget things, and they become one of the major powers that will be Assyria's undoing within a fairly short period of time. So he does do that at the beginning. But the main thing that he was interested in was avenging the losses that Assyria had sustained apparently at the hands of the Egyptians. Again, this is a very interesting detail in Assyrian annals. We never have a specific description of what happened to the Assyrian army when it was attacking Egypt. We have the biblical account that the army was basically destroyed by the death angel. We have the Egyptian account that the army was attacked by field mice. You remember all that? The Assyrians don't give us any account of what happened. They just said, we went home, you know, kind of leaving out all the salacious details of what uh, was actually behind it. But one thing is very clear, they were upset. And the Assyrian annals do make it clear that there was a belief that it was necessary to go back and take another run at Egypt, that something had gone sideways and that it was time to come and teach those Egyptians a lesson. And Ezra Hayden seems to be the king that thought he was the one who could do that. And so we have really Ezra Hayden's whole career is tied up in Egypt. He, from 780 down for about five years, prepares very significantly for this battle. He launches attack across the Sinai Peninsula, but he is immediately met by Taharqa. Now, you'll remember Taharqa. You do remember Taharqa, don't you? La two weeks ago, when we were talking about the Assyrian army being wiped out, we mentioned that the pharaoh that ruled in Egypt was Shabiktu, who was an old man, he wasn't really up for big battles. He's the guy that's mentioned by, Assyria, by uh, Herodotus. He calls for help to Taharqa, who's king of the Ethiopians. 
And Taharqa begins mustering an army to go and help fight off the Assyrians, but before he can get there, the Assyrians are wiped out by this plague, and they go home. A couple of years later, Shabiktu dies, and Taharqa becomes the pharaoh of all of Egypt. He's mentioned in the Old Testament, we read the text last time, that mentions him by name. So this is the guy who now brings his army up, he's a very ferocious warrior, and he confronts the Assyrians and stops them in the Sinai Peninsula. So, you know, strike one, didn't work this time. That was in seven or 674. Ezra Hayden goes home, licks his wounds, puts together an even bigger army, and comes back for a second bite at the apple, and this time he comes with almost overwhelming force and is able to take control of, upper, or of lower Egypt, the north of Egypt, down to Memphis, which is right at, the t- right at the bottom of the Nile Delta. I neglected to mention, by the way, that Manasseh, who was ruling, read the tea leaves, figured out, I'm going to start making payments to this guy. So even though he was under no compulsion to do so, he voluntarily decided he was going to pick up where you know, Ahaz had left off, really, and began, and began paying tribute. So he becomes, once again, a revenue source for the Assyrians. So in 671, we have Ezra Hayden coming. He's, he uh, defeats Taharqa at Memphis. But in 669, Taharqa returns and recovers Upper Egypt, not all of Egypt, but Upper Egypt, that is the South. I know that's confusing, but Upper Egypt is the South. So Egypt is split, and that's where we kind of leave things with Ezra Ezra Hayden. Ezra Hayden, having lost a big chunk of of Egypt, appoints his two sons over the holdings of Assyria, Babylon. The son that he appoints over Assyria is named Ashurbanipal. Then Ezra Hayden comes back, He launches this next campaign, but he dies en route, never gets back to Egypt. So that's the very short raid of Ezra Hayden. As I say, it has not much connection with the people of God, but it sort of connects the links here a little bit. And that brings us now to Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal is a name I've mentioned several times along the way. He's the last great king, some people would say the greatest king, of the Assyrians. He's never mentioned by name in the Old Testament, but he is the king who did take Manasseh as a captive to a dungeon, uh, probably, and uh, so he's the the Assyrian ruler that we had at least allusions to in the biblical text there. He is the king that left this vast library that was discovered by Austin Henry Layard in the year 1846. Austin Henry Layard was the 19th century version of Indiana Jones. Remember that. He was a British nobleman and adventurer, and he believed the Bible. I don't know what the state of his heart was, but he really believed that when the Bible talked about these Assyrians, that they must have been a real people. Even though critical scholarship at the time in the 19th century with the rise of liberalism and so on was really discounting pretty deeply the idea that there ever were Assyrians. It was all being dismissed more or less as so much myth, biblical legend but no historical fact to it. And Austin Henry Layard said to himself, I'm going to go find those Assyrians out there in the sands of the Middle East. And so he went out with camels and stuff. You know, he had a lot of money. And he started poking around, looking for what he thought would be likely venues where you would find the city. And indeed, he did find Nineveh. And as he was digging down into the ruins there, he came into this huge room filled with tablets written in cuneiform. He knew he'd found something very important. Nobody read cuneiform at the time, so no one had any idea what they were reading. But as scholars began to pour over these documents, a whole new vista of ancient Near Eastern history came into light, and much of the material that we take for granted these days, including the Gilgamesh epic, the Enuma Elish, and other things we've talked about earlier, all of these were discovered. And they were all compiled by Ashurbanipal. So he was kind of a scholar king. He was a great warrior, but on top of that, he also had this interest in kind of sort of pulling together the great discoveries and great uh, achievements and so on of prior civilizations. When we look at the palace 
It's got all kinds of graphics around it, you know, these kind of reliefs that were etched into the wall. This is a typical one, Ashurbanipal is hunting. This is a relief in the palace of Nineveh. He also liked to pass himself off as the priest king. Many ancient Near Eastern monarchs would do this, that they united both the kingly and priestly office. It was forbidden to do that in Israel, as you know, until Messiah came, who would be the priest king. Otherwise, they had to be kept distinct. But the others would tend to do this routinely, and Ashurbanipal was no exception. Ashurbanipal also decides to go get Egypt. And so in 667, he marches a vast army to Thebes. And you'll see Thebes is down in the lower part of Egypt. And he wants to just take the whole nation and make it part of the Assyrian world, end of conversation. So he launches this. Of course, he already controls the north. He wants to bring this army clear down to the south. Taharqa, who's still ruling, organizes a double cross, a rebellion among the princes that were in place to the north and comes down and sort of seals him off, locks him in, in the region of Thebes. So it's kind of a dicey moment for Ashurbanipal, but he's able to scratch his way out. He wipes out all these rebels that had double-crossed him up there to the north and puts in one ruler whose name is Necho, N-E-C-H-O, Necho, who's going to rule in the north. Then Ashurbanipal comes back in 664 and sacks Thebes. And that's the event that's referred to by Nahum because this was a, an event that was felt around the world. Thebes was viewed as a holy city. There was a great temple there. It was viewed as kind of a site that you would, uh, you know, make part of a pilgrimage. And so for Ashurbanipal to come and destroy that city had a significant impact on the psyche, not only of the Egyptians, but of many, many others. And it was so well known that as you know, Nahum could make passing reference to it, and immediately people would know what he was talking about. So that takes place in 664. And that results in Assyrian control of Egypt for a while. So now we have, under Ashurbanipal, this huge domain, including Egypt, which has been the apple that they've been trying to get a hold of now for some time. Same year, Necho dies, his son Somaticus takes the throne, rules for 50 years, Somaticus. He is uh, the son of Necho, and he's the founder of the next great Egyptian dynasty called the Sait dynasty, S-A-I-T-E, and uh, it unites Egypt once again under one ruler. This, by the way, is a shot of uh, Somaticus I making an offering, kind of a votive offering there, to uh, one of the Egyptian gods. Ashurbanipal goes home having defeated the Egyptians, Manasseh is already making tribute payments, so he doesn't bother Manasseh. He does go up and lay siege to Tyre, the island city there in Phoenicia. The city of Tyre was notoriously able to withstand a siege because they were actually out off the coast, you know, some distance, and they could get resources from the sea. And so, even though he puts them under siege, he doesn't conquer them, but he does give them some grief for a while. While he has Tyre under siege, Gyges, that I mentioned earlier, asks for help because he's being attacked by the Sumerians, C-I-M-M-E-R, Sumerians, who are cousins of the Scythians. They are equally orc-like. And so Gyges sees these people coming and he pleads with Ashurbanipal to come and help him out against the Sumerians. And he says, if you'll do this, I'll be a willing tribute payer to you as well. Well, Ashurbanipal does make a sweep through Anatolia, but he snubs Gyges. Gyges was very upset about that. He goes home. For about five years, he's engaged in local skirmishes, kind of keeping Elam, keeping Mesopotamia in control. And this brings us to what I like to call Ashurbanipal's very bad year. 653 was kind of a turning point, although probably at the time it may not have seemed that way entirely, but we sort of see the beginning of the unraveling taking place here. First of all, Lydia, Gyges, 
agrees to support the Egyptians, Somaticus, in a revolt against the Assyrians, 653. So that's the first big problem that Ashurbanipal runs into. Somaticus, who he had put in place and was supposed to be his loyal, faithful, devoted puppet king, breaks out from under the Assyrian control. And just about the time Ashurbanipal is going to run down and deal with Somaticus, he gets massive rebellions elsewhere, including Elam off to the east, Phoenicia, Philistia, and Judah, and that king Manasseh, who decides to join the party and, along with all these others, participate in this great revolt, thinking, you know, he can't take all of us. And so if you have all of these revolts everywhere, then maybe we can actually slide out from under this Assyrian domination. Also, the Medians participate in this. So you can see, looking at the map, that Ashurbanipal has his hands full. He's got problems everywhere. And he's going to take about the next five years putting down all of these rebellions, which he does successfully accomplish with a great deal of brutality. One by one, he beats these people into submission. He makes particular mention of the king of Judah in Assyrian annals. The king Manasseh is captured and taken in chains to a dungeon in the city of Babylon and held there for at least two years. We, of course, read about that in the Old Testament, and it does comport with what we otherwise know from history. Manasseh, the king of the Jewish people, now finds himself in this abject, horrific circumstance of being in a dungeon. And it's there, after a while, that he, like the prodigal son, comes to his senses and repents. He humbles himself, the Old Testament tells us, recognizes that he has been way off base, and shockingly enough, for some reason that we aren't real clear on, Ashurbanipal restores him to his throne. And so for the last two or three years of his reign, Manasseh is restored and tries to undo the damage that some 40 years of ruling had wrought in Judah. He's not successful in fixing all the problems he caused, but he at least makes a valiant effort in doing so. So Manasseh has that little cameo appearance here in the reign of Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal succeeds in putting down all these revolts, and the last few years of his reign are surprisingly quiet, largely because there's no more military activity, and generally speaking, the Assyrians didn't write it down unless it involved bloodshed. And so, really, the last 20 years or so, it's not that nothing was happening, but it seems that the Assyrians were able to dominate without much reject or much, much protest, you might say, uh, much rebellion, the ancient world. So we want to just note what was going on back at the ranch during these last few years of Ashurbanipal's reign, from 647 to 627. Manasseh dies in 642. As I say, the last two or three years, he tries to redirect the people of God. But you know, once you push the moral uh, sort of ballast in a certain direction, it's hard to turn it around. And so the people weren't quite so willing to reverse their direction, even though, Ash uh, even though Manasseh himself had repented. But he dies too soon to really be able to accomplish much. Anyway, he's followed by his son Amon, who only reigns for two years, and he is assassinated in 640. And he's followed by his son, Josiah. And Josiah is a great reforming king, and we're going to look more deeply at his career next week. So we just note that he becomes the king in 640. It is in 640, or pretty close to that date, that Nahum thunders this short but powerful prophecy. We read some of it concerning the fall of the bloody city, referring to Nineveh. This city, which had been singularly responsible for more gallons of bloodshed than any civilization to date by far, was, of course, the source of incredible uh, anger and hatred and resentment throughout the world of that time. 
And Nahum is really voicing here, not only under the prophetic inspiration of God's Spirit, but out of his own personal psychology and that of those who had been dealing with the Assyrians, this outrage toward them. But then Nahum adds this surprising detail that the days of Assyria are numbered. And indeed, it turned out to be the case only about 30 years later that Assyria would be off the map. So it's about 640 right at the beginning of the reign of Josiah that we have Nahum coming along. Josiah is only eight years old when he becomes king. His father died very young, of course, and so Josiah, only eight years old. When he's about 16, it appears that he's rattled into a kind of awareness of his responsibility as king by the scorched earth prophet of the Old Testament, Zephaniah. Short prophecy, worth reading. He indicates that he's giving this prophecy right toward the beginning of the reign of Josiah. It'd be about this time frame. And it seems that it was Zephaniah that awakened Josiah to the need to begin, you know, fixing all the problems that had been created by his grandfather Manasseh. And he begins the process of trying to refurbish the temple. And a number of things happen in consequence of that that I'll save for a later discussion, but some of you are familiar with the reign of Josiah, and you know that he was, a, he was ferocious in his attempts to try to restore proper worship there in Judah. In 627, in the 13th year of Josiah, Jeremiah is commissioned, also a young man, as a prophet, and his career spans about 50 years. Jeremiah will be the great prophet who is going to be there all the way through this next several years, culminating in the moment when Jerusalem itself is destroyed by the Babylonians. So a huge amount of what we know about that period of time from inside Judah comes from the pen of Jeremiah. Well, it's early in the reign of Josiah that he's commissioned, and so we want to take a look at his career as well, and we'll do that. The end of Assyria looks a little bit like this. Ashurbanipal died in 627. Immediately, the kingdom was plunged into a civil war between his two oldest sons. Civil wars are never very good, of course, for continuity and for stability. And for about five years, this civil war rages between the two older sons of Ashurbanipal. Finally, at the end of that five years, the guy that comes out on top is named Sin Shar Ishkum, but is better known in history, I'm sure you heard of this guy, Syracuse, right? And I have to tell you a little story here. First time I taught this, I was reading some anecdotal material about Siracus, and there's this rumor about him that he was a cross-dresser. <laughs> and there seems to be some truth to it. And I mentioned that to the ninth graders to whom I was teaching this. I don't know how many of them even knew what a cross-dresser was, you know, but anyway, I mentioned it to them. And, and, and I just made that, and it got a few little snickers, you know, and that's what you do to try to keep them half awake. And then the year went on, and at the end of the year, this is like six months later, and I'd forgotten all about this, I said to all the kids, okay, I want you to write down the top three things you remember about everything that you've learned in Bible context. And of course, I'm expecting good things like, you know, the fall of Jerusalem in 586, and, you know, I'm expecting good substance, the Exodus, you know, and so on. And every kid, <laughs> item one on the list of every kid, Siracus was a crossdresser. You know, what do you do? <laughs> so, there was a little <laughs> note to self there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how much that's going to serve their spiritual growth throughout their lives. I don't know what their lessons they're going to derive from that. But uh, anyway, I hope you remember a little more than that detail. But uh, there is some, at least, evidence that that was the case of this rather perverse character, Siracus. But he did emerge as the Assyrian king. Well, while he's engaged in that civil war, a native Chaldean by the name of Nabopolassar is able to come in under the radar because the Assyrians are all embroiled in their own controversy and seize Babylon. A native Chaldean, his roots went clear back to Sumer, 
And he comes up and he's able to take Babylon and, and consolidate his control of it pretty handsomely during these years. So in 623, when Siracus finally comes out on top in this civil, convent, this civil war, he then goes down to try to retake Babylon and he's met by a pretty powerful adversary who's been able to consolidate his power named Nabopolassar. Nabopolassar and Siracus battle for about five years, from 623 to 617. Gradually, Siracus is losing power. He so bloodied himself through the civil conflict, and there's such a loss of morale generally, a kind of malaise in the, in the Assyrian world by now, that this new guy, who's a brilliant military strategist and a great inspiring leader, is gradually able to gain against Siracus, so that by 616, Nabopolassar can march on Assyria, pressing in and actually besieges the city of Asher in 616. It doesn't fall at that time, but it shows how, how powerful he had become vis-a-vis -vis the Assyrians. Surprisingly, Siracus decides to appeal to the Egyptians, <laughs> the people whose city he had sacked. Well, Ashurbanipal, his father, had sacked some years earlier. Sematicus, who is still ruling in Egypt, picks up the phone and says, sorry to hear you're having trouble, pal. Well, hope, hope things work out. Be warmed and filled, I think is what he said to him. But no great help comes. The, uh, the Egyptians sort of promise, oh yeah, we'll, we'll come up and help you if we can. Don't call us, we'll call you, is sort of the response there. So Siracus realizes he's got a major problem now. In 615, there's a twofold attack against the Assyrians. Syaxares, the ruler of the Medians, marches against Assyria from the east, while Nabopolassar, the ruler of the Babylonians, marches against them from the south. They besiege and destroy Asher in 614. And then two years later, in a dramatic and really shocking fulfillment of what Nahum had predicted, the city of Nineveh, this great bloody city, is destroyed. It's put under siege, but it just so happened that that very year the Tigris River flooded way beyond anything that was normal. It, it broke, it breached one of the kind of the defensive walls. The Medians and the Babylonians were able to come in galloping through the streets just as Nahum had predicted, and it was over uh, very rapidly. Siracus, for his part, gathered his court together in an inner, inner chamber of the palace built a big bonfire, and went up in flames with all of those who were closest to him. And that becomes the end, for all practical purposes, of the Assyrians. I want to pick up then the story of the Babylonians and the uh, Medians next week, but I want to give you my Sunday school lesson this morning from the material we've covered here. And it, of course, as you would probably guess, has to do with Manasseh. Four lessons. One. Manasseh was a bad guy. He was, however, a descendant of David, and he was actually an ancestor of Jesus. He was in a royal line that is kept intact, of course, through the years, but he was a bad guy, and he knew better. There's a New Testament verse that says, a man should judge himself so he will not be judged. And that's the first lesson we all need to take to heart. There's a kind of inventory we should all take in our own lives on a daily basis. We should be saying to ourselves, is there anything in my life where I am tolerating that which I know full well is inconsistent with God's call to holiness? Jesus says, if your eye offends you, gouge it out. If your hand is a problem, cut it off. It's hyperbol hyperbolic language, graphic, dramatic because it's supposed to leave an effect. If there's anything in my life that is having the potential to drag me away from my allegiance to Christ, then I should go after that with a killer instinct, get rid of it. That's what Manasseh should have done. He should have judged himself so he would not be judged. So that's lesson number one, friends. Let's judge ourselves so we can avoid worse consequences. Because when you fall into the hands of the living God, sometimes it's not all that much fun, you know. And for Manasseh, he was loved because of the chain of family he was in, and God loved him enough to discipline him through these Assyrians.
And so that's lesson number two. Sometimes God disciplines the son that he loves. And I, pr- I imagine all of us in this room have been there at some time or other. Discipline at the moment doesn't seem pleasant, the author of Hebrews tells us. I don't think Manasseh was enjoying it all that much when he was there in that dungeon. But that apparently was what was necessary for him to come to his senses like the prodigal son came to himself. Sometimes we have to be under extraordinary pressure before we'll kind of see the light, you know. And so God lovingly puts Manasseh in the worst possible circumstances he could have imagined. And what happens? Number three, Manasseh repents. Lesson number three, no matter how bad it is, no matter how deep the hole is you've dug, no matter how much trouble you're in, you can always repent. And God will always come back to you with grace. And even Manasseh, who had done some horrific crimes, he had offered his own son as a burnt sacrifice before a pagan god named Molech in the, va- in the Valley of Hinnom. You think, how could there be forgiveness for anybody who does something like that? And yet, when he's broken, when he humbles himself, even he is given grace. And that should be a great comfort, a great encouragement to all the rest of us, shouldn't it? That no matter how much of a mess we may have made, we can always come back and repent. But number four, the little reality check, his repentance, though it certainly restored him and reinstated him, didn't fix all the damage he had done. That there was an ongoing effect of the career of Manasseh, which is remembered clear down into the days of Zedekiah. Manasseh continues to be appealed to as the guy who had led Israel into such horrific crimes that even though he himself repented, he couldn't stop the locomotive that he had started down the track in the direction of the destruction of his people. And the lesson we need to learn here is that our lives today matter. That the, the effect that you're having on your children and on your grandchildren right now matters. That parents who say, well, I'm not going to try to maneuver, I'm not going to try to instruct, I'm not going to try to guide, form, help, or otherwise alter the thinking of my... I'm going to let them grow up and make their own decisions, are fools. We are given a responsibility to shape the direction of those in whom God has placed our trust. And if we just leave them to their own devices, the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. We need to direct them in a direction that takes them toward the Lord Jesus Christ and the proper worship of that one. And when we leave them to their own devices, we do so very much at their peril. The father of the Jews at that time, in a sense, was Manasseh. And he set them going in a direction that he himself could not reverse as much as he wanted to later. As much as he died in the grief of realizing what he had accomplished, he couldn't fix the problem he had solved, even though he had repented. So my fourth lesson to all of us is every day, let's be super scrupulous because somebody is watching you. Somebody is watching you, a child, a grandchild, a friend, a neighbor. When my dad passed away this last, you know, about a year ago, uh, in April, just slightly less than a year, uh, there were a bunch of little kids in the neighborhood who loved him. I don't know these kids, I don't know their names, but they knew him. And every, they would come, I was there sometimes when they would just come by and all give him hugs. He was just this grandpa figure to them. And I was there, I was the one that told them that, you know, Bill had gone to be with the Lord. And they were all visibly shaken by that and kind of went off as little kids will, you know, there's like eight, nine, ten-year-old kids and so on. But it struck me, even as they digested that Bill was gone, how much of an impact he had had on those little children. Those little kids loved him, and they knew they could come to him, and they did come to him. Somebody's watching you. And just like Manasseh, we can have this wonderful effect for good or a not-so-wonderful effect for ill, depending on how we make use of that opportunity.